I'm going to start by introducing Eric and Jen. Um, we are very lucky to have them on the call this morning. Eric Caraga is the Executive Director of the Denver Economic Development and Opportunity, a position that he assumed upon his appointment by Mayor Michael B. Hancock in August of 2017. Formerly, he was the Chief of Staff at Denver International Airport, and he currently lives in Five Points neighborhood with his wife, Gabby, and dog, Kuma. Did I say that right, Eric? Hopefully so, beautiful. Yes. And then Jen Morris is the Chief of Staff of the Denver Economic Development and Opportunity. She was formerly the Director of Marketing, Communications, and Government Affairs, and she'll tell you how quickly she moved over into this job and what happened a week after she was promoted. <laughs> um, but she, prior to being at the Denver Economic Development Opportunity, she was the Vice President of Marketing and Communications for Mile High United Way. And she currently lives in Virginia Vale with her husband, Clay, and dog, Maximus. I love that name. So welcome to both of you. Thank you so much for sharing your time with us this morning. Um, I know we will end a few minutes early because as many folks, they have a call right at 10 as well. So we're gonna jump right in. And Eric, I have a first question for you. And as I'm asking this question, again, I'd love the audience to chime in with any questions or thoughts throughout this, and I'll be sure to watch the chat function to call on you. But Eric, my question for you to get us started is, tell us about the first few weeks after COVID really became headlines. How did you, look, how did you lead through this? The, the daily changes have just been um, through the roof, and, and you guys more than anybody have really had to deal with that. So tell us how you've led through that. Yeah, thank you for the question, Elizabeth. Uh, good to see you, JJ. Uh, great partners at both Chamber, EDC, and Leadership Foundation. So thank you for having uh, Jen and I. I see my colleague here, uh, Anthony Graves. And uh, yes, it has been uh, interesting to get where we are today. Set the stage uh, a little bit uh, as we look at the metrics, uh, 1,062 deaths statewide. You all know that's a, a bigger number than we'd like to see, and unfortunately, we'll see that continue to grow. Um, the stay-at-home order for Denver actually started on March 23rd. Uh, I believe the state uh, followed a few days later, and then we extended it through May 8th. So now we're in this activity where we are seeing our non-critical retail, our field services like real estate, personal services like salons, and hair tattoos and uh, limited uh, health care coming back online as well as non-critical manufacturing. From this point, we're working on aligning with the governor uh, and our orders through May 26th in anticipation to hear from the governor on May 25th. I think really the only difference uh, in, in our program for the city and county of Denver is we chose to go a little bit later. Uh, we really work with our health, health department, our health officials and our uh, city agencies and our, our chief health um, um, official here, Bob McDonald in Denver, and decided we needed to prepare. We needed a few more days. But now uh, I think we're pretty much aligned. The key difference is the requirement to have face masks or face coverings indoors, uh, I think is the, the major difference there. But mass gatherings through 10 people go through uh, May 26 as well. Um, just wanted to kind of set that stage. So in terms of your, your question um, and the reaction of the city, that is, Elizabeth, um, it was quite interesting. Uh, I was actually uh, advancing for our inaugural flight uh, to Rome. So I was in Italy at the end of February. And when I got to Italy, it was everyone's like, everything's okay. And then as the news came in, by the third day I was there, a lot of people were wearing masks. A lot of people were kind of in this uh, um, uncomfortable stage. And as I returned to Denver and, uh, you know, sitting in the mayor's office and our weekly and daily meetings, we saw that wave beginning to progress as well. Um, it's quite hectic environment. And very quickly, uh, I think that um, we pulled the right levers, uh, especially financially in terms of suspending uh, new hires in terms of really um, activating our EOC immediately. Um, so um, you're right, it is day to day um, and uh, it's, it's completely evolving. Um, if you want me to go into it deeper, um, happy to happy to do that, Elizabeth. Uh, I'll certainly 
be diving in deeper as we go. So we'll get there, I think, Eric. Thank you for that. I appreciate the setting the stage for us as well. Um, Jen, let's start with you also and ask a question. You faced um, more than any of us can imagine in the past few months, of course. There's been a lot going on, as, as Eric just said. Can you put your finger on one of the biggest challenges you faced and how you've been adapting to that? Sure, thank you. And thank you again for having me here, everyone. Um, I mean, to be completely blunt and honest, one of my biggest challenges was I was promoted to chief of staff about 10 days before um, for, you know, economic development for the city, about 10 days before we started going, going into a, a global health and economic pandemic, an absolute crisis that we've never seen before. So um, while I was still doing my previous job as director of marketing communications and government affairs, which I'm still doing because we have that hiring freeze that Eric uh, <laughs> mentioned, <laughs> you know, I, then all of a sudden I had to wear a completely different hat, have a completely different perspective and lead, and lead the staff um, you know, through this, there were so many unknowns. Um, staff didn't know what was happening. We didn't know what was happening. The emergency operations center was activated. Our joint information center was activated. All of a sudden, you know, we had to work remotely, try to uh, put our services virtually um, that we had never done before. Um, and as chief of staff, I really want, I was worried about staff morale and what they were thinking, um, how they were feeling. So it, it was a lot going on all all at once, um, to say the least, and, it, and it's still happening. You know, it's still going on. There's still a lot of unknowns. Uh, many of you may have already heard that last night uh, the mayor announced that the city staff is going to have eight furloughs through the end of the year. And so I think, you know, everyone, since we started going into this economic crisis and, and public health crisis, staff, city staff have been working around the clock. I, I have to tell you, there's, there's a lot of hours, there's a lot of weekends, there's a lot of tears um, when we can't help every single person we want to help. And then, and, and the underlying looming um, thought of, are we going to get laid off? We know that, you know, the city's budget is, is hurting. Um, and so furloughs, I think, was, was one of those things that staff was wondering about for the last month. And I think, and it finally happened. So now we have that other challenge of how do we keep staff morale up, keep the work going, knowing that we're all public servants, we're here to serve the community, but, but it's hard, right? So, so it's, been, it's been a challenging, I would say, six, six to eight weeks. I'd like yeah, to, no I think we've all had uh, similar challenges with uh, work from home and I think we were lucky in a way because we actually were maxed out in our office capacity with uh, our 110 employees. So 95% of our team had laptops, but, um, and so we were able to go on day one pretty quickly to work virtually. But, um, you know, I think um, there are some challenges in addition as we are working on alignment and coordination with the region and the other mayors, with the state, the federal guidelines, the different health agencies. So I think uh, there's numerous challenges around that alignment and coordination. I think it's getting better and better each day as uh, we're performing, storming, norming, building those bridges and, and finding our communications cadence with our partners. So both obviously on our employee side and, and really all the stakeholders. Mm -hmm have to reach, uh, especially on the public sector side. Yeah, Eric, can you expand a little bit on that? I mean, the daily operations uh, have got to be taking a toll on you. I mean, there's folks that need to be in the office, there's folks at home that need to work, but what are the daily operations looking like and how does the relief effort of this magnitude take shape? So we activated our emergency operations center in March and it really consists of all all departments across all agencies, but a lot of external partners as well. Um, so it's not just our planning and public works and housing and all of that infrastructure. Uh, it includes uh, DPS and it includes a state official that mans the desk, obviously safety professionals. So that office actually ramped up to uh, probably 80 to 90 people working in the basement of the building. As this evolved, you know, we didn't want more than 50 people in the room, 10 people in the room, and we had to evolve as well. Um, obviously, there's a lot of people that need help. There's a lot of people that want to give help. There's a lot of people that want to sell us things. And so, uh, and then everything uh, with the media and information flow, um, it, it was just, it's just an amazing atmosphere. Today, we are uh, ramped down. We try not to have more than 10 people uh, in that space and um, uh, had to learn how to do all sorts of forms and procurements and 
every procedure you can think of online. So it burned in my head are strange forms like the, oh yeah, that's a 212R, we need to do this. <laughs> so there's a bureaucracy to it, but you know, in, in an emergency state, you do need every agency head, every leader, every senior leader, and, 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 and the executors in the room to make uh, the fast decisions that we've had to make. Um, so now we're progressing. The, the Emergency Operations Center was never meant to, to my belief, exist for the two months that it has already. Um, and we're looking to ramp that down in the next month. Typically, we activate the EOC. If it's the Broncos Super Bowl, we have a million people on one spot. Or we had the fire in Uptown off of 19th and Washington or it could be a flood or storm or a DNC type situation. But um, now we're adjusting and knowing that um, this is going to be protracted. And so we now have multiple chairs uh, led by the mayor as we ramp down the EOC operations and the agencies are actually going to start taking some off of this work on. I mean, the, the juggling and collaboration you guys have to do is, is spectacular. And it makes me think, and Jen, maybe you can help talk to this one, but we have at the Leadership Foundation our Colorado Civic DNA, and that represents values of, the, of leadership, responsibility, shared vision, inclusivity, and collaboration. Um, collaboration is clearly something you guys are working hard on, and you have to, right? There's no other choice. But how else are you seeing these values show up in the work that you're doing, Jen? Yeah, I think, you know, those those values of um, are the exact same values I think we have as a city. I mean, if it starts with leadership, we look to our, our mayor for his bold leadership and for empowering city staff to really, you know, do what needs to be done right now. Um, and I think he's been an awesome leader, um, not just for the city, but I think he's a, a, he's a leader across the country that other cities look to him. Um, you know, the other shared vision is an interesting thing, too, because when we put together our Economic Relief and Recovery Council, one of the first things we did was put together a charter. Why are we doing this? What are we all here? And what's that shared vision that we all have so we don't have, you know, scope creep? We need to keep focused on. And so what we came up with is that, you know, that our vision is that the city and county of Denver emerge, emerges from this stronger than we were before. And so if we keep our sights on that, and that means um, everybody, not just the people who were successful before, but how do we make sure that the entire community, that there's equity involved. So equity, I think, and inclusion is another thing that, that is one of your values. And, um, you know, equity is, is, is going through every single thing that we do. We have a whole equity office, which um, Anthony Graves is on here, is, has been very involved with, but also, um, you know, even as we look at recommendations and how we want to support the city and how we want to support the residents and businesses, we actually have an equity checklist that we go through. So before we even, um, you know, present something to the mayor, we go through that checklist and make sure that we have equity in mind when we have the, that the, the residents who, who need, you know, it's not just equality, right? So we talk a lot about equity versus equality, that we are helping the people who need it the most and we're not just helping those who have a voice, right? So, um, and even one of our committees is really focused on equity and the voice of the worker, the voice of the neighborhoods, the voice of the streets in Denver who might not have those vocal advocates. Um, so we wanna make sure that that's there. Um, and then you said collaboration, of course, everything <laughs> that we do is in collaboration, not just between our, our city agencies, but between everyone from the state, from the federal, everything is, is about collaboration. We couldn't do it. This is not um, for the city to fix. It's for everyone to lean in for the public, private, and philanthropic sectors. Yeah, yeah. Well, you guys are nailing civic DNA, so well done. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lot. It's a lot to consider. Um, looks like Kitty Hook has a question. Kitty, feel free to unmute. The stage is yours. Um, Eric, I emailed about this yesterday, but how is the city set up for new and existing development projects using online services, and has it slowed up the process, adding additional time to getting their approvals? Great question. So that is a major focus of one of our subcommittees for construction and development, and we're looking at a, a few areas in order to, to speed things up. Uh, this is a couple of weeks ago, but as I spoke to Laura Aldrete, our, our city planner, uh, really the conceptual pipeline seems to have slowed down, but there's also, you know, obviously a lot of activity in terms of permits. Uh, the physical office is still open, so that desk on the second floor of the web building um, is still taking in um, 
uh, in doing their review processes. Um, so that is continuing as well as inspections. But, you know, we, as we hear from the business community, so I think I could talk about more about the Economic Relief and Recovery Council that the mayor propped up. But as we are working with the Construction and Development Committee, a lot of these suggestions are being highlighted. So, you know, virtual inspections uh, are, are one area uh, that we're looking at. Uh, looking at the zoning process and how can we change quasi-judicial hearings, uh, such as the planning process, so that they can be conducted virtually. A lot of this work has actually happened in, in the last week or so. Um, you know, in terms of uh, online, um, online capabilities, uh, I think uh, Laura did send you a link yesterday. So I hope that worked and that, that, that helps you, but I'm uh, assuming with all the processes across the city and especially when it comes to development and touching on so many different agencies, you know, this is one of the mayor's charge said, be bold, let's streamline, let's do what we can. And, uh, you know, just for example, um, the restaurants and patios, as we're looking at uh, restaurants, uh, we're looking at, you know, if there is a 50% uh, condition on their capacity indoors, how do we keep them profitable um, and, and get them to even? So can we relieve traditional policies and let them encroach upon the private right of way and the public right of way and the street closures and the parking lots. And to do that, we really had to have excise license, city planning, public works, uh, fire inspections, rethink uh, how we do things. And hopefully, you know, um, and I believe these are, um, these are ideas that are being enacted right now to help companies uh, survive and get online as fast as they can. In your case, uh, let's keep development going. Let's get shovels in the ground, people working and investment flowing. So we're looking across the board on how the city can really um, think things differently in this new world. And I, I'm happy to see that, um, uh, that we are moving in that way. Um, uh, and it's at the mayor's direction. Thank you, Kenny, for that question, um, and Eric for the detailed answer. It looks like we've got another question from our friend Kenneth. Kenneth, the stage is yours. Good morning, Jen and Eric. How are you guys doing? Good. How are you? Good. Well, first, I want to thank you for all that hard work, and you know, this is really building off of Kitty's question. I, I, I've been part of the development and and construction ERRC that Eric was mentioning there, but what are what do you think are the main strategies or industries that will lead us out of this the the current economic challenges and and what are the obstacles to that and with that how can the private sector and the public sector work together to to overcome these obstacles just kind of more macro. Kenneth is cheating a little bit because he's serving on the Construction Development Committee for the ERRC, and he's supposed to provide me these recommendations. But <laughs> like he said earlier, um, you know, we are basically, it's a white sheet exercise of 2020 budget, as well as what we're looking at at our cut capital projects. But we do have projects that are bonded for select accelerate those projects where, where we do have those resources. Um, we'll look forward to what future stimulus funds would look like in a, in a new COVID era type program uh, like the Recovery Act and see uh, what uh, really start planning now so that we have uh, projects that are really in the hopper and ready to get going. So we talk about other areas and I guess more macro, you know, obviously um, the supply chain is going to be different going on in the future. Um, JJ and I had this conversation a couple weeks ago uh, in analyzing really 2008 and 2009. Uh, if you look at the metrics and the top five metrics from Denver having a 9.7% unemployment rate to, you know, CR3 and eventually down to 2.3%. Uh, if you look at metrics across the board, we came out of that recession harder or better than our peers. And I think, you know, um, obviously we all want to get back to 
that level we were at in 2019, but um, it's going to look at a lot of levers uh, beyond just construction and jobs. And so, um, you know, we already are, uh, and I think uh, JJ already is on his side, um, getting calls and actually visits uh, in our pipeline for uh, prospects uh, that want to relocate their businesses here. So I think there's more to come. Uh, in terms of your very academic question, I think it's a, a great question and uh, that's part of the recovery strategy that we have to develop. Yeah, and I, I just want to add, I think that that's exactly why we have, you know, stood up the Economic Relief and Recovery Council. We, you know, every industry is going to have its own challenges. We're on calls with industries every other day, different industries, and hearing their challenges, hearing their struggles, hearing their ideas. Um, I think that's just what we need to be doing is we need to, we need to bridge that gap between the private and public sector by communication and by keeping the communication open this council is bringing together you know construction development small business large business anchor institutions um, large employers restaurants entertainment hospitality um, and i'm missing something cultural institutions all under kind of one one roof to really think through what are the challenges for each industry and how do we solve these together and so you know i hear i was on a call yesterday with uh, venues and event planners and so they have completely different challenges than manufacturers and they do and restaurants have some similar ones as well but you think about a wedding and you think about social distancing and you think about when you do your seating for a wedding and you want to have people mingling they can't do that any anymore they're trying to figure out how do we have pods of people who are related or come together stay together so it's you know the industries all of them have their own challenges and they're and they're working through it and and they're um, and we're helping them right we're doing it together um, yeah, and, and I know how close you guys work with JJ. JJ, if there's ever a moment you want to speak up also and kind of back up or add on to what Eric or Jen are saying, then feel free to do that. Um, as we watch for more questions to come through, Jen, I have a question. I want to relate us back to leadership again. And a lot of what we've been talking about in these virtual voices is the balance of optimism and reality. And I wonder in your role, Jen, as chief of staff, what how are you expressing that to your staff, but also what leadership skill has really been put to the test for you personally through all of this and having to work with so many people and a variety of people? Yeah, um, it is a balance of reality and optimism. And I think, uh, I think my style is I'm, I'm, I'm really honest with our staff and there's a lot of stats out there. We send them the news clips every day that we get from the mayor's office. We send them the data without you know, any other comments for every day, just saying, this is what's happening in the community and we can talk about this. And we have, our, um, we have an all staff, virtual all staff every other week where we have an average of 99 people join. Um, and so we can keep them updated. And we started that right away. We started that week one, actually. We were weekly and then we went to every other week. Um, but it is that balance because I, I'm, I'm always an optimist. I'm trying to be the cheerleader for staff at the, and at the end of the day, this is just an awful situation. Everyone sees the awful data. Everyone's stressed out. But I think, I think it's just being honest and being transparent. You know, we tell them what's going on. When we get the data, we send it to them. When we um, are having struggles with, uh, you know, people, 2,000 people looking for grants and we can only give 200 at a time, you know, we talk about that stuff as a team, and, you know, in front of the 90 plus people. So um, I think the, my biggest leadership challenge is that, um, I think that actually delegation has been hard because I was new in the role. So who do I, I have a new team that I didn't really get to know. I knew them because I worked at, at DITO at Economic Development Opportunity, but I didn't, they didn't report to me before. So not 100% knowing people's skill sets, but the, the job in front of us is so enormous. It's all hands on deck. I can't sit there and try to train them for three weeks on something. You just have to throw them in, give them the benefit of the doubt, and like we'll figure it out together. So I think that was at first I was holding so much together, but there's only so many hours in the day, days of the week. You can't hold on to all the work. I think we just have to quickly make decisions, delegate it, and and you know elevate people and let them let them um, go on their way. Yeah, I mean it's trusting your team, right? It's trusting that it's, they can yeah. get it done. Yeah, yeah, and it's trusting a team that you hadn't worked with before. So. Right. I think Jen's uh, lying a little bit. Her biggest challenge is probably managing me. So. Well, I didn't want to say that. That's a given. <laughs> yeah, I think that went unsaid, Eric. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, looks like we've got a question from Dan Mooney. Dan, great to see you on the call. Uh, 
The mic is yours. Well, thanks guys for being here. And um, you know, there's a- Dan, I'm sorry, we're having a hard time hearing you. Can you hear me now? A little better, yeah. No, nope. yeah, better, okay. Oh, there we go, perfect, thank you, Dan. So common sentiment and change management is never let a crisis go to waste. In that context, what glimmers do you see for a better new normal when we come, to the, come out of this? I mean, one of the things that I'm hoping for is more working from home equals less traffic. What are some other things you guys see? Uh, that would have been uh, my top one, the, the efficiency of working home. We were looking at taking up more real estate in the Denver Post building, actually. And so I look uh, at some of the names here, I guess maybe some of the commercial real estate people <laughs> side of the uh, equation. <laughs> Not like that response as much but you know in our leadership meetings um that is definitely part of the the equation um you know in terms of um how how we function going in into the future and not knowing you know whether it's kind of this two-year drift uh or, or beyond um before uh, the health crisis side of this subsides um, obviously, um, there are certain job sectors that, that are doing better. I think we're all getting our delivery from Butcher Block to uh, Whole Foods and, and everything else. And, you know, my wife and I were talking, we're like, wow, why were we going to the grocery store? This is really time effective and time efficient. But uh, yes, the impact to traffic. Uh, but obviously, you know, um, there's other concerns when it comes to what, what the future brings for uh, city uh, facilities and infrastructure, uh, like the airport, like our partners at RTD. So um, there, there are some positives that are coming out of this. I think some silver linings too are, the, I mean, obviously the better use of technology and collaboration has come out of it with Dito. You know, we've because we had to stand up, a, we did stand up a grant program so quickly, we literally, our business development team is relying on our neighborhood equity team, our DISVO, our Dis, uh, Division of Small Business Opportunity team, like everyone from every other division has to lean in, has had to lean in and help them. So I think we br we're breaking down some of those silos because we had to, and I think people are gonna have better understanding of what other departments do, um, and maybe a little more respect for the, the volume that they have been dealing with, the people they've been dealing with um, and supporting. I think there's, we're, we're on a lot of calls that are very cross departmental. And while we did have that before, I think it's, it's a little more extreme now. And I think um, I'm hopeful that some of those silos that, it, that exist everywhere are broken down a little bit. And I am super personally happy that everyone has been using Microsoft Teams because I, because Dan, you know, we use that at Mile High United Way and some teams use it more. And when I got to, to back to the city and I tried to get everyone on Teams, they were like, what is this? I forced the marketing team to use it. And now they're like, thank you so much. Now, you know, when, when this happened, we literally all, immediately, almost the whole city got on Teams, right? To have these calls and to share documents. And now, it, now that's the new norm. I don't see us going back to not being that collaborative and sharing documents and working on things and, and, when, um, and having these kind of virtual calls when we are at home, if we're doing staggered meetings. So I think that that's a silver lining, I think. Yeah, and I think from a city perspective, and it kind of goes along the theme from earlier, but um, just really figuring out how we could streamline our, our pro uh, processes and be a more business friendly environment. And uh, that's one of our major tra uh, charges. So whether it's our development review processes all the way through, um, you know, it's, uh, really we're looking at our procurement processes, streamlining those, our inspections, uh, the way we conduct permits and just being a lot more flexible for the business community as they come online and hopefully these are long-term consequences. Thank you guys are spot on. A lot of what, what we've witnessed is the grace that people have with each other and that desire to connect or reconnect and it really is allowing more access to more things because of this virtual world and I think that's that side of the silver lining is really great. Of course there are other inequities that have come up but but the access that we're all having to be able to do those cross-departmental and agency meetings like you're talking about too, Jen, are, are a wonderful thing. Um, Eric, I want to tap on you for, for a leadership question as well. I mean, in your role, is there a vulnerable moment that you'd be willing to share with us that you've experienced while leading your team? You guys, I'm sure, have had a roller coaster of emotions and different kinds of people with different kinds of emotions. But what about you? Have you had something 
that you can share? You know, um, we've had um, some people that um, uh, have gone to the hospital and, you know, obviously that's uh, tough and emotional for the staff. Um, and so, you know, I think anybody with the larger organizations uh, uh, see that, but we are a bit of a family. So that piece is uh, uh, not all COVID related, of course, but, um, you know, it's really trying to keep the family together. And as Jen said, uh, it's been great. We have uh, 110 people in our all staff meetings uh, every other week. So we get the family together and we have uh, get to see people's cats and dogs and kids running around in the background. So that that piece is uh, helpful so we can support each other. But, you know, in general, areas in which you're vulnerable, I think sometimes, you know, a, a system with 13,000 employees like the city, we're our own biggest enemy. We could really shoot ourselves in the foot. So, you know, as agencies are, are reacting, um, there's duplicative work, there's like, oh, that's not within your corporate Leo, the charter says this, and there's a little bit of arm wrestling, but we all have this common goal of really defeating COVID. And at the end of the day, we, we get together. But, um, you know, I think a lot of that um, um, is uh, just the, the alignment piece when you work for such a large organization and a government organization. So uh, we're, we're seeing that being streamlined, but uh, it, this, this situation is so ever evolving. Uh, and uh, it, it really takes, it takes all agencies to work together to, to work in a fast fashion. Uh, we're really seeing ourselves still in this urgent relief period before stabilization. And we are trying to work as fast as we can on dozens and dozens of initiatives at the same time. And I've never seen uh, the city execute so quickly. And, and with that, it's, it's just chaos. It's amazing what we're all capable of when we have to be, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I, I wanna make sure we, we talked about ending a little bit early because we, we have another call, you guys right at 10. Um, as we close out, I do wanna ask both you, Eric, and you, Jen, how your alumni network, and, and that means us, those of us on the call, how can our community help support the work that you guys are doing, um, whether technically your ideas, but advice or suggestions you have for the audience on the call today on how we can help support all this amazing collaboration and work that you guys are doing. And, and Jen, let's start with you. Thank you. Um, I think there's a, there's a few ways. I think um, staying involved, staying informed, helping spread the word of, of the truth. There's a lot of information out there that's, that's not true. The city's website, denvergov.org slash COVID-19 keeps all the latest information out there um, as far as what the city's doing, but what's happening as far as public health orders. Um, so anytime you can share that, you know, follow the social channels and make sure that you're staying informed, but also you're informing the people who are in your network. I think if you have the means to volunteer or, or if you have the means to absolutely, you know, donate to the, to the causes that are helping out. There are so many people struggling right now and it, the city is not going to be able to help every single person. But I think if we all lean in together, right, we can, we can, we can make a bigger difference. Um, and then of course we have the Economic Relief and Recovery Council. You know, Kenneth is on there. Um, I think other people are involved there on this call. But if you do have ideas, questions, or you feel like there's an industry that that might not be represented or anything, we are taking all of those in um, at our mailbox ERRC at denvergov.org. And uh, we man it all day, every day, and we, we read them, we triage them, and we send them to the right people. A lot of times we're realizing we're getting a lot of information or questions from the same uh, folks within different certain industries. So then we set up industry calls with the mayor's office, with our team, so we can hear their ideas. Um, so I think, you know, I know the city doesn't always seem to be as, as open. There's a reputation that the government has, but everyone here is really is, is relying on the public sector and to lean in and to help out and to give ideas because we can't do it alone. Did I get that email right in the chat function, ERRC at denvergov.org? Yep. Perfect. Wonderful. Eric, what about you? Yeah, no, it's similar, but your, your alumni community, really the business community, you're the boots on the ground, and we really need to hear your ideas. Uh, that's been critical to the restaurant reopening strategy that we're developing. Uh, we're working very quickly. Um, I mentioned earlier that, uh, you know, that 
well, I would not discount the innovation uh, and ideas from the business community, private sector, nonprofit sector. Uh, we need to hear those ideas. And so, you know, as we're moving forward with variance requests, uh, because we believe we could uh, open up the botanic gardens outdoors very safely and working very closely in line with the state on that. You know, now the next frontier is with restaurants and how we can uh, get them at least profitable. Um, we're hearing that 50% is not profitable. So how can we expand their uh, capacity outdoors? And we couldn't uh, be doing this work without the feedback and uh, feedback we're getting from the restaurant associations in addition to the restaurants themselves. Uh, now it's migrating now towards venues, small venues, medium-sized venues, and then eventually the culturals. But, um, you know, what we hear commonly is do not do a one-size-fits-all policy. Uh, do not just mandate 50%. Try to be uh, as flexible uh, and listen to us because we have some great ideas where we can operate safely. So I think that I'm only touching on three sectors and there's... Mm -hmm more, but um, right now is the time to get that feedback and input as uh, we align, as we look to some new milestones. Uh, we are actually striving to at least get an intake form for restaurants, for example, tomorrow. Uh, we don't have the date from the governor, but, but you know, in order for us to execute, we have to have excise and license, fire inspectors to go out, we have to have uh, public works if you're going into the public right-of-way, we have to have city planning, there's alcohol considerations, and then notify neighborhood groups. So all of a sudden they don't think there's gonna be this big outdoor party in front of their house. So, uh, but, in, but we need to do that even though we don't have dates yet. We have to anticipate and get ready. So, um, and, and we know that um, uh, it takes time for businesses to gear up, uh, especially restaurants uh, to get their supplies in and get their employees back on. So I use that as an example, but uh, I think that impacts a lot of sectors. Thank you, Randa. And that's, like you said, one example of one industry, but those kind of ripple effects and how many people are connected to ensuring this all happens safely is for every industry and every sector. I'll give you feedback that my husband is thrilled that golf courses have been reopening. I know Kitty is probably as well. <laughs> so thank you. Yeah, I think I'm also thankful because I need a break from him. They're the only profitable agency right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> They're happy for that. Um, yes, Dan, we have time for one more question. So Dan, why don't you ask your question? And then I'm going to wrap it up before you ask your question, though, Dan, if I may ask everybody on the call, um, we're asking you to put one or two words in the chat function about a takeaway that you've had from this call. Just let us know really quickly one or two words, kind of some of the takeaways you've experienced. And Dan, the mic is yours. Okay, how's my mic working? Perfectly. <laughs> okay, so I was <clears throat> thinking about another industry that um, has really risen to the top in terms of importance lately, and that's early childhood. And that has always been sort of focused on from an education standpoint. But with this crisis, it has really been recognized as an economic driver, the role that uh, child care plays in supporting our first respond responders, essential workers, and so forth. Um, and that industry is in crisis for a bunch of different reasons. Um, what impact do you think your department can have in uh, strengthening that up, or just what thoughts do you have about that? Yeah, so we have our um, sales tax carve out for our early childhood uh, education program. So that's one asset that we have, um, and that's not within my department, but I know that the Office of Children's Affairs is very focused on that. Um, we do have on my side the economic recovery team, and we've propped up a social safety uh, net team as well, and that's still in formulation, but that's on top of the list, as well as housing, um, um, mental, um, mental health, food access. So we're compiling um, all that right now and should have more to come in, in that sector. Uh, in, in terms of our department, we are part of the Work Now Collaborative, and we have our construction uh, collaborative um, a work team going. And one of the services that we provide is uh, vouchers for childcare for workers. Uh, we also provide vouchers for workers that maybe their car broke down and they don't have the 
checks to um, uh, to fix it. And these checks are actually through, we work with our partners and they're cut within tw uh, within hours actually of vi visiting one of our workforce development shops, which is now virtual. So we do have some assets there, but I think it's a good question. I think we need uh, to really focus in on this uh, area, era, uh, area now that we're in this environment. That's great. Jen, did you want to add anything to that? You want me to know? Yep. Good. I, I think you got it. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you, Dan, for that question. Um, and I want to thank you both. Eric and Jen, thank you for spending time with us. I know these Zoom calls are back to back to back, Teams or Zoom, whatever platform, but <laughs> we appreciate you um, taking time for us. This is always very informative. I thank everybody on the call. Thank you for your participation, for the words and the comments. Um, a reminder, this is recorded, so you can find it on our website. Also, you can check our website or the network for future virtual voices. Next week, we have one that we've talked a lot about here today about the events and hospitality industry. We have um, one of the owners of Occasions Catering coming on, also um, one of the founders of Imprints Events, which is a, a nationwide event company. We also have John Shagel from Snooze. So they're gonna be talking a lot about a collaborative that they've put together around how to support that industry that has been hit pretty hard. So we hope you'll join us next week, May 19th. And thank you guys so much for attending. Jen, Eric, thank you again. We appreciate you. Everybody have a wonderful day.